Uh, Matt Lovin and Chris Reed playing gospel. Blue Men's Barbecue will be here again. And we have some flyers. Do you have them out? Yeah. Okay. And so you can grab those, put them out, share it. And with this info, I should be able to make an event on the Facebook page as well, and we can share that far and wide. That's going to start. Dinner will be at 5, and the music will be from 6 to 7.30. Um, so start start spreading the word. We've got a couple weeks here, so we want, want the word about that to go out. Anything else you want to mention? So if you would like to be a part of that, like to contribute in some way, we certainly, it's about the time to start gathering folks together to talk about those plans. So we would certainly love your support for that. Let's, let's take a moment, just, just uh, as we do every once in a while, just take a deep breath in. Invite the Holy Spirit to fill your heart and our hearts together. Aside the worries of the week or day or month or year. Lord, we come here first to worship you. We are grateful for all these ways you have, have guided us to love you and love our neighbor. But first, Lord, we must be filled by your Holy Spirit. Lord, in this hour, through our singing, through our praying, through the proclamation of your word, may we be filled that we may reveal your love to one another and to the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Given everyone a week off this week. So, would you stand as you're able and join me in prayer? And we, uh, we do not have screens this morning, uh, so as we're praying and hearing uh, and, and singing, you can mark those pages in your book that are relevant. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we pray for your holy church universal. That you would be pleased to fill it with all truth in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything is in the mist, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of him who died and rose again, and ever lives to make intercession for us, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And as you've lifted your voices together, I invite you to share Christ's peace with each other today.
you pray with me as we prepare to hear the words of Scripture? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. We'll first read the Gospel lesson today from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34 and 53 through 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him, and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. And the second New Testament reading from the epistles will be from Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one, and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also, also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember very early on when I was uh, when I was first appointed here. The cycle it must it must be year A, where it goes through Galatians. Galatians is a letter that is all about circumcision. And uh, every once in a while, uh, uh, some of the liturgists, some of y'all, and especially I remember Phil Norwood would say, "You always give me a text to read about circumcision." <laughs> Especially that back end of your New Testament, circumcision comes up a lot. It's a little awkward, right? You know, we don't usually talk about uh, private parts in church. And so it's a little, a little strange whenever it comes up, but it, it really was the center of some very important 
theological arguments in the early church. And so I have, I have racked my brain this week and talked to friends and whoever trying to figure out how we can wrap our minds around what that meant to someone in the first century. Circumcision is and was the marker of Judaism. It's how you knew you were part of that uh, faith, but also that nation that you were circumcised or your male children were. And so it was a marker of national identity, uh, religious identity, and also sort of cultural identity, right? And, and I, I, I have tried to think of an example, and I'm not sure we have a perfect one. I think the clearest thing we can think of is uh, faiths and cultures where you grow up, where men uh, grow beards, right? Uh, Amish tradition, right? Some of those Anabaptist traditions where the men grow beards and usually they have specific clothing they wear that kind of make them stick out if you, if you see them uh, see them out in the world, right? Or certainly uh, brothers and sisters who practice the Islamic faith, right, have certain ways they dress and, and have a tradition uh, where men grow a beard and they're supposed to. That's maybe the clearest example of sort of a cultural, religious uh, sign in that way. But I don't know. Around here, it's almost like your social security card and the cross your grandmother bought you at your baptism. Right? It's, it's kind of both of those things. Um, it's, it's maybe... See, this is where I struggle. Is it, is it the color blue you root for? Maybe? Kind of. Is it how you make your barbecue sauce? Sort of, a little bit, not quite. It's what makes them who they are. And so you can understand when uh, people start worshiping Jesus as the Messiah, the church then is a type of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew, he was circumcised. And we see him as connected to that, that Jewish Old Testament God. So if we're welcoming Gentiles in, do they need this necessary marker or not? If you're converting to Judaism, that's a requirement. Is it a requirement for us? It's a, it's a deep question. How do we tell who belongs? When Paul answers this question... His practical, and, and, and by the way, it's also a stand-in for all the Jewish law. Are you going to keep kosher? Are you going to follow the Sabbath restrictions in the way Jews do? You know, it's, it's sort of the big symbol of that. Paul's answer is no. We don't have to do that. Converts don't need to get this marker. They are brought together into the body simply by Christ's death and resurrection. But he's actually stepping back and making a bigger point, if you listen to those words I read. And his point is, this new church is Christ's body on earth now. And if you start dividing it into factions, you are pulling apart the body of Christ. If we start calling ourselves not Christians, but the circumcised and the uncircumcised, and that's, that's how we define ourselves, we are in trouble. If you set yourself in opposition to a brother or sister in Christ, you've already lost. Sometimes in a an author's biography or someone's blurb about themselves on social media, they'll sort of give you, give you a list of their attributes. And they'll say, you know, father, husband, uh, <coughs> cinephile, uh, uh, woodworker, you know, they'll kind of list the stuff about them. And then somewhere on the list they'll say, follower of Jesus or Christian, right? Sometimes they put it first. 
but they include it as part of the list. And I think what Paul would say to that is, these things do not belong on the same list. These are attributes, hobbies, things about you. They're important, but to follow Jesus is at the root, or should be at the root, of everything else you do. Christ's blood, his death and resurrection, is the foundation of our whole lives. He uses structural imagery. It's the basis. And when we start getting that confused, we pull apart his body. A little under 200 years ago, the Methodist Episcopal Church split in half. Methodists, going back to John Wesley, had been prohibited from owning slaves. And a certain segment of our people, at that point, going along with the abolitionist and anti-abolitionist debates of the 1800s, they said, maybe that should be allowed. After all, everyone else does it. This is how we run our society. And so the church split at that time into north and south, and there was actually a third branch, but we're not going to worry about them right now. And they eventually came back together. But it took 100 and, oh, you know, what, like 110 <laughs> years? It took a while, even after the Civil War. And it seems to me, as we lived in what, what you might uh, negatively call the sort of remnants of the American church, or kind of the last bit, a shadow of what was. Church is kind of dividing itself along, if not those lines, along left and right lines, aren't we? Going right along with the fight out there. And in doing so, we're further tearing apart the body of Christ. Now, I want to give you a positive example because I'm not all negative. Just because we're supposed to live in harmony does not mean we always, uh, we never take stands. In the early 20th century, uh, Methodists, especially, were at the forefront of ending child labor. Eight-year-olds going into factories and crawling into machines. Lee Lovett will tell you stories about kids going into the mill up here when he was young. The Methodists pushed against that practice, not because it aligned with their political beliefs, but because it aligned with what they believed about Jesus. Because it was the right thing to do, not because it was their party's platform. And so, today I think we find ourselves at a point where the body of Christ is continually pulling itself apart because of these other identifiers. Not circumcision and uncircumcision anymore, but our deeply held beliefs about who we are coming into conflict. But Jesus can bear quite a lot. And we can find him when we extend a hand of peace to one another. When we look at each other, despite whatever those differences are, and honor each other as children of God, it not just reforms the body, <laughs> 
I believe it builds up our own souls as well. And so, it's not all doom and gloom. We have the chance every day to live at peace with one another and to honor each other. To make Christ the foundation of who we are. <coughs> After all, even though we have hundreds of thousands of denominations now, at least we, some, some denominations wouldn't agree with us, but we affirm that those are all part of the body of Christ. We're not the only church, but every church that worships in God's name is part of that body. We're all baptized into him. And ultimately on the last day, we'll join together in one song. And so it seemed appropriate to me, especially after Anders uh, taught us about baptism on Thursday, to remember our baptism. We haven't done this in a little while. And um, your baptism, whether you remember it or not, was your entry into Christ's body, your new birth, and ultimately it is through his grace that we are all connected and that hopefully we can all live at peace with one another. So I invite you to turn to page 50 in your hymnal if you're able. You know some of these. There's a lot of I do's. Um, and as we remember our baptism, consider these vows and perhaps reflect on ways we might we might allow Christ to work through us in living these vows in our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without Christ. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, Will you remain faithful members of Christ's Holy Church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I will. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Let's just say the Apostles' Creed. I won't do these, these interludes. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. See, they always try to put the modern words in the hymnal as if someone used them. When I, whenever I do communion, they have the Lord's Prayer in the updated version, and it always throws me off. Maybe someday we'll, we'll update it, but not today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. 
Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of the womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit and by this gift of water call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For you have washed away our sins and you clothe us with, with righteousness throughout our lives that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Some of y'all were baptized here. Some of us were baptized thousands of miles away. Some of you were baptized in the ocean. <laughs> Some of you were baptized in a river, perhaps. And we remember our baptism not because that time didn't take, but because it's always worth remembering those who helped us in the faith and to remember God's gift of grace to us. So I invite you, if you're able, uh, to come and stand, and we'll just dip our fingers in the water, and I'll, I'll come over to you.
we thank you for the baptism in which you incorporated us in your church and ask that through this remembrance we might be called to peace with one another, to honor our brothers and sisters in Christ as your children, and indeed to love our neighbor as you have loved us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. At this time we'll say goodbye to the live stream and lift up uh, joy.